All right, here we go. Okay. Did I go over the structure of the neuron? Yes. I did. But you haven't made a video yet. No, you haven't posted the video yet. Oh. Did I, I and I I'll go over the parts of the brain. Yeah, we need the parts of the brain. Did you I don't know if you went over the neuron matrix. Yes, I did. Yeah. I'll never forget it. Yeah, you did. Right? And I even remember that class. Wait, and I said, wait. no longer can you say I have to pee, I have to micturate. Remember? I don't remember that. I didn't say that. that yeah. Was the no. no. I listened to the recording the other day. You didn't say that. Well, you know what? We should just get this fight over with okay. now. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. I'm not dead. No. Yeah. And the Yeah, well, I'm not going to go over that because there's no intugumentary system. What slide? Yeah. It wasn't like old and classless on the fly. Yeah. yeah. But don't ever look at that stuff. No, we and don't educate yourself either. No. Never. Okay, ready? I'm going over the parts of the brain, Becca. You good with that? So Wait. Can record this or are you over? I'm recording it. Look, we've been recording for almost two minutes. Okay. Ready? Here we go. Starting with the lowest portion of the brain. The lowest portion of the brain is called the brain stem. So this has a lot of the much older parts of the brain. So all animals have a brain stem. So the brain stem primarily deals with um, the biological and physiological functions of the body. Let me go into more detail. The lowest portion of the brain stem is the medulla or medulla oblongata. No worries for the rest of your days. Medulla oblongata. No worries for the rest of your days. <laughs> better write this down, better not pout. The medulla oblongata controls breathing, as we discussed, in the respiratory system. Ah, remember? Also, it controls heart rate and blood pressure. So damage to the medulla will affect breathing, heart rate, and blood pressure. Hmm. Directly above the medulla is an area of the brainstem called the pons. The pons is also involved in breathing. It regulates the medulla. It prevents us from over expanding our lungs so they don't burst. Just think if your pons didn't work, your lungs are like pff, 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 and then boom, you pop. Also very important, there is a specific part of the sp uh, pons called the reticular activation system. Mm, very big words. The reticular activation system is involved in your sleep-wake cycle. This is what allows you to go to sleep, so it kind of cuts off stimuli from your body and kind of puts to sleep the cerebral cortex now will watch. The reticular activating system also partially paralyzes your skeletal muscle. So have you ever got the myoclonic jerk before you go to sleep? Right before you sleep, you're like, right? And that kind of says to the muscles, okay, I'm shutting you down for the night. The reason for that is when you go into REM sleep, your muscles become paralyzed, partially paralyzed by the reticular activating system. Are you with me? So when you're dreaming, that's why when you're running, it feels like you're running in jello. 
because there is a disconnect between what the brain is thinking and what your body is actually doing. Tell me you got that. People who sleepwalk, they don't get that disconnect. So they wake up and act out their dreams. Tell me you got that. Has anyone here ever woken up and then been paralyzed where they can't move? That's not good. No. <laughs> It's uh, normal. People have that all the time. It usually lasts like 30, 45 seconds, maybe a minute, and then it goes away. But it feels like forever. Yeah, I know. Can you say it feels forever? Tell, tell me you follow this. Now, now watch. I'm going to show you something. Right over here, there's a little gland called the pineal gland. The pineal gland secretes a hormone called melatonin. Have you heard of melatonin? Now watch. When you close your eyes and go to sleep, 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 when you close your eyes, it's dark. And when you close your eyes, the pineal gland will uh, release melatonin. And that will activate the reticular activating system telling you it's time to go night night. That's why in the wintertime, you tend to go to bed earlier than in the summertime because it stays lighter longer. So if you're having a problem sleeping, one of the best things that you can do is make your room as dark as possible. That's why people don't sleep good. They have their TV going, their radio going, and they have their textbook next to them. So when they wake up in the middle of the night, they're like, oh, yeah, there it is, the left clavichord. I knew that. <laughs> Tell me you follow that, right? That's why melatonin is given as a supplement for people with jet lag or people who have a hard time sleeping. Nothing? I thought that was pretty good information. Are you guys dying on me right at the end here? Oh, well, that's good. Mm -hmm. Cross-referencing, I like that. <laughs> the midbrain, this is the seat of our emotions and memory. This is part of what's referred to as the limbic system. This is where you get angry. This is where you love. This is where you hate. Like. Me and Itra, we have this love-hate, love-hate kind of thing. Tell me you got that. You also have an area of the brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is where you learn stuff, you remember stuff. Tell me you got that. And then there's another part of the limbic system called the hippocampus, and the hippocampus takes short-term memory and then sends it out to different parts of the brain to establish it as long-term memory. Now watch. People who develop Alzheimer's, one of the things that happens to them is they can't remember if they eat. But they're, I remember in 1934 when Uncle Jed took the, you know, the Etzel to church and he threw up. Never forget it. But they don't remember if they ate. That's because long-term memory is spread throughout the brain. Short-term memory is located in that one specific spot. Say yeah. Then you have the hypothalamus. Do I have to describe that? No, I don't. We went over that. Controls hunger, temperature, thirst. One thing I would like to say about the hypothalamus is the hypothalamus is intimately connected to this little dingleberry that hangs at the base of your brain. That little dingleberry is called the pituitary gland. Whoops, what happened there? I'm going back. Tell me you, you followed that. The pituitary gland is referred to as gland master P, the master gland. And the hypothalamus, which is involved in homeostasis, regulates the release 
of hormones from the pituitary gland. When you uh, go into advance, you'll learn about all the pituitary hormones. You following me so far? Okay. Then you move up to the thalamus. The thalamus is the gatekeeper of your brain. It allows sensory information. It determines whether that sensory information is going to reach the conscious level. It, in some people who have ADD, everything outside them is stimulated, right? Everything causes them to have, sti they can't focus. You got me? And they believe it has to do with the fact that the hypothalamus isn't really doing its job. It's not regulating the amount of sensory stimuli that becomes conscious. These people are overstimulated, right? They need this constant stimulation. So how, have you ever heard of a drug called uh, Adderall? What Adderall does is it gives you the brain, it stimulates the brain itself. So these people don't have to look for outside stimulation. That's what allows them to focus. That's a very quick and dirty explanation of how Adderall works. <coughs> Tell me you got that. All right. Let me give you an example of how the uh, thalamus works. Say, for example, you're driving home after a wonderful class at Gateway Technical College. You got me? You always recognize the same make and model car that you're driving. Right? Because yeah. your first thought is, <laughs> that person must be cool too. <laughs> Tell me you got that. So sensory information that's important to you, the thalamus is going to allow it to reach conscious level. You can be in a big room of people, <laughs> back up. You're always going to hear your name when it's called out because that's important to you, so that allows you to focus on it. Let me give you an uh, example that's the opposite. What I'm talking to you about right now is not going to reach conscious level because you'll think, this ain't important. What's my Facebook status? Come on, that was a little, no? You're sick of me now too, I get it. I am too. I don't like me. That's why I don't shave. I can't stand to look at myself long enough to shave. <laughs> you know where she's going? She's pr going to put neosinephrine in her nose. So when I pop it, it don't bleed. <laughs> that is so stupid. Yeah. All right, so watch. Are you ready? The next portion of the brain connects the two hemispheres of the brain. That portion of the brain that connects the two hemispheres is called the corpus callosum or callosum. You got me? Now, you know this, or at least you should know. How many people have had psychology? Good, so cut it out. There are two hemispheres of the brain, right and left hemisphere. And there is contralateral innervation to the body. I hope that tape worked because that sounded good. Yeah. The left side of your brain controls your right side. The right side of your brain controls your left side. I don't know why that's important. I don't know why that makes sense, but there's got to be a reason. Tell me you, you got that. And each half, each hemisphere of the brain has very specialized functions. We'll learn more about that in, adva in the advanced class. but. What I want you to uh, know are some of the basic areas of the cerebral cortex. So the cerebral cortex is the newest part of the brain, right? So what it does is it allows you to hear, see, smell, taste. But what really sets us apart is the frontal lobe here. And more importantly, the prefrontal lobe. This area of the brain is the seat of our humanity. This is what allows you to reason, to understand things, to make computations. Are you following me? We're the only species on the planet that knows at some point we're going to die, right? Because we are conscious. Say yeah. 
So did I explain to you what a lobotomy is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What they do now is they will do chemically induced, they will give you drugs that will induce uh, damage to the prefrontal lobe. So you'll end up being fine. You'll end up being a student at about 8.30 in this class. What happened? Why aren't you not? I know, we sound like a married couple, don't we? <laughs> I don't want to have to tell you. You should just know. Yeah, as I live and breathe. Okay, so watch. These are the areas of the brain that I want you to know. Just generic, general. The temporal lobe, involved in hearing. The parietal lobe is sensory, right? Touch, pressure. The occipital lobe, vision. Say yeah. Here's a part though that's important. In this lobe, part of the frontal lobe, is the primary motor cortex. This is where you initiate movement. Now this is important. If the primary motor cortex was only involved with movement, everyone would have these real herky-jerky kind of spastic movements. So your movements are refined by the little brain. And that's what cerebellum means, little brain. And this little part of the cerebellum, or this part of the brain, the cerebellum, actually refines movement. And the neurotransmitter that works in redefining that or def uh, refining the movement is dopamine. And dopamine is made in a part of the brain called the substantia nigra. You've heard of this? No? And dopamine is a neurotransmitter that allows the motor cortex, primary motor cortex, to communicate with the cerebellum. So when people who have Parkinson's disease, they lack the neurotransmitter dopamine. That's why they shake, their gait is shuffled, right? And they're kind of spastic due to that lack of the neurotransmitter uh, dopamine. Now, the problem with that is, again, as I explained to you with the blood-brain barrier and the lack of the lymphatic system, is that to treat nervous system, central nervous system disorders, it's very difficult to do that. So you have to kind of trick it into it. There's a drug called L-DOPA. Have you heard of that, mm -hmm. L-DOPA? That's a, a very powerful drug used to treat Parkinson's disease. Say yeah. The ultimate treatment for Parkinson's disease and most diseases will be um, stem cells, where they'll be able to implant them in the substantia nigra and they will start producing dopamine. Have you ever seen like Michael J. Fox when he's not on L-DOPA? Right, he's like, it, it's just miserable. That's just awful. Tell me you got that. Those <clears throat> are the parts of the brain that I'd like you to know. Say yeah. You didn't want any of the, um, you were talking about the brain stem and you didn't want that, you didn't want that? No, I want, the, I want the stuff that I talked about in the brain stem. The medulla, con, okay. say yeah. Okay. All right? Okay. Let's talk about, I, I went over the parts of the neuron, right? The cell body, the axon? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, all right, what I'm going to talk to you about now are the two biggest special senses. And the two big special senses that I like um, concentrating on are vision and hearing, all right? Why you got two eyes and not just one big one? And just so you know, while you're taking the lab final, I'm going to have this picture up. I'm watching you. That's right. Are you finally done? You're welcome. Did you? Good at one or two. You know, I'm such an idiot. Let me explain why. Right, if you really need an example. 
I always said to students, there's no makeup test, you know? But then I always let them make them up. Yeah, but they ask all the time. And then I break down like a little one. I'm going to be tough next semester. Yeah. Did I touch, did I start the eye at all? No. Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> Where's your lacrimal gland, your tear gland? On the top of my right hand. That's right. That's very good. Everyone thinks your tear gland is here. That's wrong, right? Because watch. If you were going to clean a window, would you start here? No. That's really weird. So your gland is up here, so when you cry boo-hoo, washes away any impurities or objects that may come into eye, like maybe like your stick shift. Watch. And there are little canals in the corner of your eye. And they will drain the tears into the lacrimal sac and then the nasal lacrimal duct and then out your nose. That's why when you little kids cry boo-hoo because they didn't get the G.I. Joe with the Kung Fu grip. <laughs> Say yeah. And watch. When it's cold out, the air is dry. The cornea has to be kept moist. So the lacrimal gland will release tears that's why your nose runs when it's cold out. That's good party talk. Like, hey, you ever wonder why your nose runs? We're all just pretty much dying here, huh? Mm -hmm. All right. Did you ever see that kid with the tympanic membrane booger? He's like five years old. Bam, that thing just popping out. They could blow bubbles, man. Take off, fly away. All right. So when you look at the outer part of the eye, the some of the um, exterior anatomy of the eye, you have eyelashes. Some have uh, more eyelashes than others, right? Like they could be used as forklifts, like. They're called eye wigs. I learned about that. Eye wigs. <laughs> Those things look heavy, man. I mean, for real. Aren't they? Eyelashes? Yeah. Fake eyelashes. That's a lot of work, man. Does she really? The girl that was in your class, the, the one you Nicole, did. remember that we were talking about going to? Who's Nicole? Mm -hmm. Anyway, she makes a lot of money doing it. You can make a lot of money doing eyelashes if you're good at it. Like, I'm going to practice that on my break. How do you see eyelashes? How do we, I'm, I'm the only one that can digress, degrees. <laughs> Watch. Eyelashes are hair. So, they have a sebaceous gland that releases an oily substance to allow your eyelashes to remain soft and supple. Sometimes you can get an infection of that sebaceous gland within your eyelash and you get a sty. That's what a sty is. Say yeah. All right, so watch. Let's look at a cross section of the eye, shall we? This is a cross section of the eye. I want this. There are two divisions to the eye, two general divisions. There is the anterior chamber. That is everything in front of the iris and in back of the cornea. You got me? And the anterior chamber of the eye is uh, filled with this clear liquid called aqueous humor. Is the cornea alive or dead? Why would you say such a thing? Oh, look at her. 
Did you read the book? No, I watched it on DVD. Cheating, huh? <laughs> okay, watch. The cornea is alive, but you can't have blood vessels flowing through your cornea, otherwise you'd see little red blood cells going by. So you need to have some way to nourish the cornea and remove metabolic waste. Tell me you got that. Aqueous humor is responsible for that. I'll go into more detail in a minute. Now, the iris is made up of circular bands of muscle and radial bands of muscle. And how the radial and circular bands are pigmented with melanin determines your eye color. That's why people who originated at the equator, they have dark eyes, dark hair, dark skin. As you move farther and farther away from the equator, the eye color becomes lighter, hair color becomes lighter, and skin color becomes lighter. Say yes. Now watch. Because there are circular and radial bands of muscle, the dark spot or the opening is the pupil. So I have a bunch of dark spots in my class. I have pupils. See there? Okay, let's just keep going. Now watch. Then you have these radial bands. Now watch, I'm gonna see, watch. Remember I told you about the nervous system, how the sympathetic and parasympathetic work together like an old man drives a car? I'll never forget it. It was a Tuesday. So watch. Under sympathetic stimulation, what do you want the pupil to do? Good. So the, radi or the circular bands of muscle will relax and the radial bands will contract and that will open up the pupil. Under parasympathetic stimulation, you want the opposite. So the radial bands will relax and the circular bands will contract. That's why in different levels of light, your eye color can look different. And that's why the circular bands are different color than the radial bands. So no one has one complete eye color. Unless, of course, you're wearing co um, colored contacts. I didn't know they had those. I had no idea. I had this one girl in, this is like 15, over, this is like 20 years ago. And I, uh, I go, can I tell you something? You have the bluest eyes I've ever seen in my life. She goes, Tim, they're contacts. <laughs> like, they make contacts that will Oh. Yeah. Exactly. Are you struggling? <laughs> no, I'm struggling with this one. Yesterday, I have to go to um, student, no, the learning center over there, talk to some of the special needs instructors, and a guy walks in in all leather, and then he had a long green fuzzy tail with a red little fuzzy ball on it. And then the lady there was saying they're furriers or furries. They're furries. And apparently that's their fetish that you have sex when you're dressed up as aminals. What? What is going on? And he was he was wearing a tail for that reason? I don't know. I didn't ask. But I'm like, look, why are you No, no, because just thinking about the furriers are making me just, I don't know. There was a CSI episode like that. Yeah, at least Can I tell you, if you're watching TV, then you ain't studying hard enough. You got me? Because you ain't got time for this. Greg, were you watching CSI? No. There you have it. That's the answer. Gil Grissom was still on there, so it was like five years ago. Good, you're talking, I don't even understand what you're talking about. Exactly. Willis. Here we go. I explained to you the iris, yes? 
Yes? yes? Okay, immediately behind the iris and now part of the posterior chamber of the eye. So the posterior chamber of the eye is everything behind the iris and in front of the retina. The retina is specialized tissue that covers the entire inside of the posterior chamber. More on that later. The, pos the posterior chamber contains a thickened gel called vitreous humor. Vitreous humor helps maintain the shape of the eyeball. It is clear translucent protein. Now, in people as they get older and especially in diabetics who have impaired metabolism, sometimes that protein can become denatured and this vitreous humor actually circulates a little bit of aqueous humor. So sometimes this denatured protein can get in front of the retina and you get what these things called floaters. Have you heard of that? Floaters are like things that are in the vitreous humor and it'll stay there for a while. You can have this for several days or maybe a couple of weeks and then finally that cy they'll cycle out. But they're much more common in people with diabetes because of the impaired uh, protein metabolism. I don't know. I'll get there, I promise. All right, so watch. Now, you have the lens. The lens is made up of concentric rings of translucent protein. And the lens you born with is the lens you die with. You got me? Now, back in the day when you had a camera, in order to take a picture that was far away or close up, the lens would move in or out, right? Well, your eye doesn't move in or out, except on Bugs Bunny and Roadrunner cartoons. So in order for you to accommodate, you can look at something close and then look at something far away and immediately um, accommodate so that the, your vision is clear. The lens is connected to muscle. Watch it, I'm gonna give you a better view of this. If you look here, you have the lens and you have this, these trans, uh, concentric rings of clear protein and then you have these suspensatory ligaments that suspend the eye or the lens in back of the pupil. So there are muscles that the suspensatory ligaments are connected to and those muscles are called ciliary whoops, muscles. And what are the two things that muscle can do? Don't you wish that was a question on the final? It was every question. That'd be good. Maybe you'll have a dream like that. I had a dream last night that I'm walking down the street and this guy's on his big skateboard and he has the body of a turtle. <laughs> and guys are putting cigarette butts out on it. Yeah. Maybe I was thinking of class. <laughs> what? Okay, watch. So, when the ciliary muscles c contract, they will tighten up those suspensatory ligaments and they will change the shape of the lens. This is how you can focus near and far. That is called accommodation. The ability to accommodate as you get older decreases. Tell me you got that. Now, watch. What's the lens made out of? And the proteins that you're made out of, they're made out of are the ones that you're born with and the ones that you die with. What are proteins made out of? Nice. And the sequence of amino acids determines the shape and the shape determines its function. So as people get older, the protein that makes up the lens becomes denatured and it's no longer translucent. It becomes opaque. That is cataracts. <coughs> Tell me you got that and they have to have cataract surgery. <laughs> Tell me you got that. All right, now watch. The ciliary bodies and specialized cells within these cells here called, I'm sorry, 
ciliary muscles and specialized cells within them make up the ciliary bodies. The ciliary bodies are made up of the ciliary muscles and specialized cells that produce and secrete. You go. You know what? You can teach this class, then I could go hit golf balls. It's still light. Really? What am I going to say next? Yeah, that's right, see? Okay, so watch. Here's the ciliary bodies. What do they secrete? What's the function of aqueous humor? It is to supply nourishment to the cornea and remove the metabolic waste. Tell me you got that. Aqueous humor is clear. Now, in the corner of the cornea, there are little drains called canals of Schlem. That was the third three stooge, right? There was Mo, Larry, and Schlem. Now watch. This is really important, especially in people with diabetics, especially in people with diabetics, especially in people who have diabetes, protein debris can block these canals of Schlem. So aqueous humor continues to get produced, but it can't be drained effectively. So what determines your IOP, and I'm down with IOP, yeah, you know me. IOP is intraocular pressure, and what is it determines is determined by is the amount of aqueous humor produced. So if you are producing aqueous humor but you can't effectively drain it, what's going to happen to your intraocular pressure? It will go up. And you can get a condition called glaucoma. So when you go to the eye doctor and they puff the little air in your eye, they're measuring intraocular pressure. Tell me you got that. Now let me explain to you why that's bad. If you look, you have specialized tissue that lines the entire posterior chamber called the retina. The retina is where photons of light are converted into electrical impulses. Those electrical impulses that are created in the retina are then transported by the optic nerve through the optic chiasm and then to the occipital lobe of your brain where they're interpreted and converted into visual stimuli. Say yes. You're with me. That was good, huh? I know, because you repeat. Nope. Nope, because I got it on tape, man. <laughs> testing, testing. <laughs> check, check. the retinal artery and retinal vein. If the pressure inside your eye builds up, you will cut off blood flow to your retina. Tell me you got that. And the first part of your retina that will lack blood flow is the outer peripheral part. So the first sign of glaucoma is loss of peripheral vision. And then as the glaucoma worsens, you will get tunnel vision and then total blindness. Say yes. So, <clears throat> so if you have the diagnosis of glaucoma, it is not uncommon for your ophthalmologist to write a prescription um, for uh, One big fatty. Because <laughs> the active ingredient in marijuana is tetrahydrocannabinoid, THC. And what um, THC does is reduces the production of aqueous humor by the ciliary bodies, thereby 
reducing interocular pressure. Like, All, like the red eyes and the smoke? Yes. Also, your pupils dilate too. So when you smoke and then you go into a bar, even though it's kind of dimly lit, you need like a welding shield. <laughs> Like you're on the surface of the sun. Did I ever tell you that time I smoked pot? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I never even really got into that stuff. You guys uh, smoke the ganja tree? Cuckoo for dopo puffs? Have you? I heard vaporizing better. No, pot. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's a Turk. Here we go. Ready, guys? How many people followed that? Yes. All right, now watch. This is, I don't know, I think this is kind of cool. Do you guys don't know anything about optics and physics, do you? Okay, good. Well, what am I going to say? That's right. Yeah. So what you actually see by virtue of the focal point, the focal point is too short in the back of the eye to actually invert the image right side up. So on the retina, everything is upside down and inverted, and your occipital lobe flips it. You don't think that's kind of cool? Now watch. This is the coolest thing. In advance, I go over fetal circulation, which that to me is the most amazing thing. But this is the second most amazing thing. Watch. Inside your retina, you have specialized cells called rods and cones. Rods are used to see in dim light, and you view things in black and white. You got me? That's why things in the dark it's hard to distinguish color because only the rods are being activated. The cones are for sharp vision, yeah, and they see in color. Now watch. When you want to see something really good, like the textbook, you don't hold it like this. Oh, yeah, that's the left clavicle. You hold it right in front of you for about 30 seconds. That's because if you hold it in front of you, in the fovea, you have the greatest concentration of cones. Therefore, you have the sharpest vision and the greatest color acuity as well. Tell me you follow that. And now as you move out into the periphery, the number of cones decreases. Therefore, the ability to determine, like, like, um, Specifics is difficult in the periphery, and the ability to identify colors in your peripheral vision is more difficult. Are you following that? Now watch. There's an area of the retina called the optic disc. The optic disc is where the retinal artery and retinal vein and optic nerve exit the back of the eye. There are no rods or cones in the optic disc. And it is just to the left and right of the fovea in the left and right eye. The question is, everyone should have a small black part of their vision. They don't. And that's because the occipital lobe interpolates your visual data and fills in the missing pieces for you. You don't think that's cool? It's incredible. Yeah, if you had a little, uh, yeah. What, what nerve is there in the baby when they do it in the bottom right where the eyebrows are? Yeah. Um, 
What's that? <coughs> yeah, I'd cough too after talking. <coughs> you just showed up for the sound exam spot and it was all left in the lower right. Yeah. Spot. Yeah. And, um, and don't you think that's kind of cool that your brain does that? I don't know. I was pretty excited about that. Okay. Um, just one quick thing about the retina. The retina is the only part of your body that you can actually see blood flowing through an artery. So that's why a lot of diabetics who have uh, peripheral vascular disease or you know buildup of cholesterol in arteries, they will actually get buildup of cholesterol in these small vessels. You can actually see the plaque in the retinal arteries. That's why um, diabetics develop what's called diabetic retinopathy, and it's one of the leading causes of blindness. That's why a diabetic has to have a dilated eye exam every year. Say, so, yeah, you got that. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the eye. Say, so, yeah. What? The optic nerve, cut it out. The optic nerve takes electrical impulses that are generated from the rods and cones and transports it electrically to the occipital lobe. So there. Put that in your vape and vape it. All right. We're doing real good, guys. All right. There's your ear. What are you supposed to say? What? Why you got two ears and not just one big one? Why? I'll just tell them. Did everybody sign up? I'm getting pizza. Is there any uh, uh, preference? Pepperoni is okay, right? Yeah. All right. Okay, we got uh, cream cheese and roll-up pickles, cookies, brownies, chocolate chip cookies. We got plates, and, right? And we got uh, crackers and salsa. And then uh, what else? What are you bringing? All right. Well, can you bring some afterwards? Yeah. All right. I'll leave that list up here, and then uh, I'll get pizza. I'll bring some over to you, too. Is that okay? All right, here we go. The reason we have two ears and not just one big one is, watch, if there's a mass murderer over there and it says, I'm going to kill you, sound waves enter the ear here, and they will actually conduct through the skulls of uh, the bones of your skull and enter this ear just a split second later. And your brain, the temporal lobes of your brain, are able to triangulate and determine the direction of sound. This is important. It becomes an issue when someone is directly in front of you or behind you. So if someone's going to kill you and they're directly in front of you, just say, Mr. Killer, can you step to the right or left and then repeat that? Then you'll know. All right, watch. You have the external ear, oracle or pinea. The function of the external ear is to funnel sound waves into the external auditory canal or external auditory meatus. Say yes. Do you ever see MMA fighters? Mm -hmm. You ever see why they got the, those ears are all kind of jacked up? Yeah. Do you know why? Yeah. <clears throat> this is type 2 cartilage. It's rubbery. You got me? When you wrestle, right, you're, they smash your ear. So this starts getting broken and damaged, and it's not replaced with type 2 cartilage. It's replaced with type 1 cartilage called scar tissue. And it's not as elastic, so that's why the ear gets all cauliflowered. That's a good look, huh? 
Hmm. All right. Okay, watch. The skin within the external auditory meatus has specialized sweat glands that are modified not to sweat, but to produce earwax. Earwax is actually protective. It protects like when little bugs go in there, right? Or stuff goes in there. Just so you know, listen up, because this is true. Your ears are self-cleaning. The skin cells within that line the ear actually slough off from the inner part to the outer part and will remove any debris. The problem comes in when you take a Q-tip and you smash and compact that earwax. It's very difficult then for it to clean itself. Then you have to get skin irrig or irrigation. You ever see it, ear irrigation? They take a, like a little syringe and they go in and they irrigate your ear and it comes out. I was doing this one guy's man, Jimmy Hoffa came out of one ear. I'm not even kidding, man. There was all kinds, like a Buick, you know, yeah. <laughs> license plate. It is nasty. What is the best way, like, other yeah, what do you medicine? The best way to clean your ear is to uh, pour gasoline in there and to light it up. No, the best way is to uh, irrigate your uh, ear. That ear candling, that actually works too. You, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the best really, if you have to do it, is to uh, um, have the professional irrigate your ear, right? No. Even though it feels good. It does, right? I know, right? It's unbelievable. I sit, I, I stay in my bathroom for like 20 minutes. Just, just, oh God, oh. <laughs> you ever, you ever put, run uh, hot water in your ear? What? You know, I look at people sometimes, and I, I wouldn't even wonder about that. I wonder how they make it through the day. I mean, honestly. <laughs> yeah, they're, it's amazing. Did I tell you about dude who had the, the giant dildo stuck in his ass? Did I tell you about that? <laughs> Tim Leifold? That guy had a death wish, man. Here we go. Watch. What separates the external ear from the middle ear is a thin translucent protein membrane called the tympanic membrane. The function of the tympanic membrane is to amplify sound waves. The middle ear houses the three auditory ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. These are the three smallest bones in your body but they are housed in the thickest, strongest bone in your body, the temporal bone. The temporal bone is the thickest, strongest bone in your body, and it protects those three delicate auditory ossicles. Say yeah. Now, these articulate, meaning they form joints. What happens to your joints as you get older? They get bigger because you, can have, you have more money, and you can buy more pot. What? Who's there? Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy. How you doing? You good? All right. We're talking about the ear. All right, so watch. All of three bones form articulations. And as you age, those bones become stiff. They become less flexible, just like the normal joints in your body. How many people have had CNA training? How do they tell you to talk to the elderly? Abusive, right? <laughs> hey, what are you doing? Right? 
low tone of voice and look at them and speak slowly. Watch it. That's because as you age, those bones cannot vibrate very fast. And watch, I'm gonna teach you a little physics here. Which has a higher frequency? A or two? Two has a higher frequency. The bumps occur more frequently. So a higher frequency sound has a higher pitch. And in order for an elderly person to hear that, those bones have to vibrate quicker, but they can. That's why they tell you to lower the pitch of your voice and to look at them and speak slowly. This is evolutionary as well, I'd like to point out. As people get older, women, when they tend to yell at their husbands, their voices tend to develop a higher pitch. And through evolution, guys lose that hearing. So they really can't hear that. No, they can't. No, they feel it. They feel the frying pan on the skull. <laughs> yeah. You know, one thing I have to tell you, and no, for real, is, and I'm here to tell you this, and I believe this from the bottom of my heart, that guys don't say anything that has hidden meaning. You, you know what I mean? Most guys, uh, they don't do that. Is Jimmy a, is, is, are, well, no, I'm just telling you that they don't. Where women think everything has a hidden meaning, and it doesn't, right? So if you take everything a guy says at face value, you're good. Like, there's no hidden stuff. Like, when they say they're hungry, they're actually hungry. They want some food. When a woman says she's hungry, that can mean 900 things. No, it just means I saw this. I saw an illustration where the guy is sitting in the couch quiet, and the woman will do this huge spiel. Oh my God, is he really? Is he, is he, is he, is he saying he's my sister? He's like, I don't want to divorce her. I'm going to start today. <laughs> it's just that simple. Right. And she went through the whole thing right. to get divorced. <laughs> right. I suppose it's true for the last few years. It is. I know. I only, I only spew truth, according to Timmy. Okay. Now watch. I'm going to educate you some more clinical stuff here. You ready? Your ear. I heard that. You know why? She said it in a low tone of voice. You just notice that? See, she practiced from what I'm educating. I'm, I'm reaching you, Itra. I'm going to be reaching you on Thursday, man. Bam. See that dude over there? Mm -hmm. Keeping his... Okay, watch. The pressure between the middle ear and the external ear has to be equal. So when you go in an airplane ride... They depressurize the cabin. So the pressure in the middle ear is now at atmospheric pressure and it's lower in the external ear. So you have to equalize that pressure. There is a auditory tube or eustachian tube that connects the middle ear to the pharynx, the back of the throat. And it is muscular. So what it will do is that muscle will relax it will open up that eustachian tube or auditory tube and allow the pressure between the middle ear and the external ear to equalize. That's the popping you hear in your ears. It's not your ears popping, it's actually the eustachian tube opening. And by chewing, it will cause the muscles in the eustachian tube to relax. That's why they recommend chewing gum to have your ears pop. I just hold my breath and hope my eardrum ruptures. That's why they tell you if you have a middle ear infection, not to f go on a plane ride. 
just walk. Are you following me? Now watch, and then we're going to give a break because Itra is really, she, she's struggling right now. Adults should not routinely get ear infections. It, it, there's something going on if you're routinely getting an ear infection. Kids under the age of five, though, it's really common. Kids under the age of two, I mean every two minutes they're getting an ear infection. Know this, listen up, because this is true. The American College of Pediatrics does not uh, recommend treating ear infections with antibiotics due to the possible buildup of multiple resistant strains of bacteria. Do you understand that? Yep. So, but parents want to feel like they're taking care of their kid. So a lot of the, especially mothers, I'm not leaving until I get my order for amoxicillin. Even though it's a bad idea. Do you understand that? And I always say to the mothers, I go, where did you get your medical degree from? So are you just posting on that? Then? Yeah, you are. You are. And you think my stories are boring. <laughs> I'm just having, come on. God, it's the last day. All right, watch. Watch. In infants, young kids, typically under the age of five, typically under the age of two, the eustachian tube is at a much more um, obtuse angle. I'm using, what is that, math term? Therefore, gook and stuff can't, slide down there so they're more prone to ear infections. In adults, your face gets longer as you get older and it drops. That's why that uh, eustachian tube is able to uh, become clear. That's why adults should not be routinely getting middle ear infections. Where Say yes. Where does it come from into your The back of your throat. That little when you have, when somebody has when somebody they have right. in their ear, is that where, is that where the eustachian is? No. Uh, they put ear uh, tubes directly into the eardrum itself. So any uh, fluid or uh, pus or, you know, exudate will leak out of that hole. And the body does stuff that makes sense. Once the infection is cleared up, the immune system will look at that tube and say, what the hell is that? And it will push it out. If it doesn't come out, then you just go in and a doctor just pops it out and the kid is straight. A lot of times you find them in the kid's bed uh, after they've come out and after the ear infection is resolved. Tell me you got that. Now, watch, and then you can go on break. Repeated rupturing of the eardrum can lead to scarring of the eardrum and, and hearing loss. So that's why um, you have to make sure you check out the kid, but if the eardrum ruptures repeatedly through repeated uh, ear infections, that's when they put the tubes in. Tell me you got that. All right, go ahead and take a break. You have worked hard. Yeah, uh, what I'll do, I got some Q-tips in that first aid